Hello, and welcome to Palisade Corporation's webcast, Modeling Time Series Forecasts with At Risk, presented by Eric Torquia of Technology Partners Limited. We invite you to sit back and relax and enjoy today's presentation. Eric, you have the presenter ball. Thank you. Uh, thank you for uh, a wonderful introduction, Jameson. And uh, I'm just going to make sure that we have our screen shared over here and uh, we'll get started. Um, today we're going to be talking about modeling time series forecasts with at risk. Um, and to get started with that, we're going to do the introductions. So this handsome gentleman over here is myself. My name is Eric Torquia. Um, I've been doing, I work with a firm called uh, Technology Partners, which I'll talk about in a few seconds. And we do, we've been working with companies since 1999 in the adoption of uh, performance management, change management, um, risk analysis, as well as collaborative best practices. Today we're going to be talking about risk analysis and performance management. Um, my uh, expertise includes um, project risk analysis, valuation, scenario modeling, portfolio optimization. Uh, I also uh, have been working with uh, VBA and Excel application development for years. Um, though my tender looking age, uh, my first spreadsheet was VisiCalc, then followed by Lotus 123, then 123 for Windows, and then Excel since 1997. I've also lectured on project management and digital dashboards at the National School for Public Administration here in Montreal. And I'm the author of the DEA model that's published in the Encyclopedia Free Collaboration. Some of the companies that I've worked with include Potash Corporation, Valet, Schlumberger, Hydro-Quebec, Extrata Copper, uh, Bombardier, as you can see, a very wide range of uh, industries and verticals. So our company is uh, basically a firm that provides strat uh, strategy, business analysis, and organizational change management services around predictive analytics, and we do it across industries and verticals because we feel that analytics is an organizational competency and to achieve that this is our famous DA model we tend to put that at the center over here and we develop uh, soft and hard skills uh, within the people uh, via training um, coaching uh, and all sorts of different mechanisms of support including how to embed analytics within the organization we offer the technology, so we are a reseller of Palisades products and services, uh, well, the services we provide them, and we work at a process level on how to embed, as we kind of mentioned here at the people level, how to embed analytics as part of a business process. And we do it with these two snakes chasing around, so how to uh, keep, basically, we constantly seek to improve, help companies improve these practices, but we also try to make sure that they're doing the practices that make sense and that are applicable to them. The fields that we operate in when we're working within the uh, analytics, aside from the, the higher holistic version, is that we do modeling in a more practical sense. So we work with Excel or any other tool that you would like to do. We do simulation, so what if on steroids. We do optimization, which is what's best. So the application of, uh, non, of uh, optimization techniques come up to the best uh, combination of decisions uh, using stochastic simulation. And today's topic, time series forecasting. Our clients include um, Valet, as we mentioned, and all these nice colorful logos over here, including Bombardier and Pratt Whitney, et cetera. So, now that we've done the introductions, let's get to work. So what are we going to accomplish today? Well, we're going to talk about time series basics. We're going to try and get an understanding about the importance of forecasting and how it impacts bottom line performance, regardless of whether you're a scientist or you are a, um, a business person trying to make a decision. You, we are going to look at how to integrate expert opinion into a time series because sometimes uh, we need to have a more qualitative view of these things while taking a data-driven approach and purely data-driven time series methods. So let's get started. Um, 
So what is time series analysis? Well, essentially, it is trying to project something over a period of more than one. So that means you are looking at taking, extrapolating a, a series of numbers to try and get a sense of uh, a trend or uh, what the, you know, a sales number might look like. Uh, different things can be used to, to build these uh, forecasts. They can include expert judgment, so going to the smart people in the business or uh, industry sources, historical data that you can get from the Census Bureau or consultants or various aggregation firms, econometric analysis, so that's when you're tying certain things to uh, production, GDP, and so on. So these economic indicators, they can be known as leading or lagging. Uh, regression analysis, so maybe looking at uh, two commodities and seeing how they progress together. And of course, usually what happens is that you're working with not just one of these methods, but his, you're mixing you're mixing them up. And generally, that tends to give the best results. Now, when we want to do analytics within a firm, and more specifically, um, time series, well, not time series, but uh, forecasting, uh, the expertise can be embedded in the firm in different ways. So you can go and try to figure out which one of these models applies to you so that if you need support in doing this and to be aligned with company objectives. So just take a quick second and go through these. These come from Davenport and Harris's latest book, Analytics at Work. Uh, this is a um, uh, something that I find is very important to understanding uh, how we work together. So you can have uh, a, a typical model that we have corporate, so a centralized model that will feed the, uh, the forecasts to the divisions or the functions. We could have a, a uh, business unit or, if you like, a functional unit that, and in this case when we're talking about forecasts, it could be either a center of excellence or a consulting unit, and they will support the various business units or functions in developing their forecasts. It could be at a functional level, so marketing might have their people finance another, and then at the end you need to reconcile uh, what those forecasts might look like, and then it could be decentralized. So every business unit or geographical uh, division of an organization uh, might have its own uh, forecasting methods and so on. There are advantages and disadvantages to all of these, but it's just a primer to kind of get the, the ball rolling. So some of the laws of forecasting. As we can see, we have these very nice law books over here. And what they tell us are forecasts are usually wrong. Um, it is very hard to come up with an exact number. If we forecast that we're going to sell 1,200 and 200 and, sorry, 12,235 units, uh, it would be a stroke of, of sheer luck that you would actually sell 12,235 units. So they are usually wrong, uh, especially when you're talking in terms of deterministic forecasts. They should carry an estimate for error. When you aggregate forecasts, you will get better results. So at one point we had a client and uh, they were a financial services firm and they wanted to forecast how much cash they needed to have in reserves so they wouldn't have to disperse additional funds during the day which needed to be couriered. So uh, when we built out the forecast, when we, when we aggregated it up into you know, uh, a region, we had a very accurate forecast. However, at a, at a store per store level, it, it, it was pure randomness. So the more you aggregate, the, the more accurate your forecasts will appear. And of course, your forecasts are more accurate in a near period of time. So if I'm looking out 12 months from now, I should have a better understanding of the dynamics affecting what's going to happen for the next 12 months than I would over the next five years. If you think about what has happened in the last five years, could anyone have predicted in 2005 where we would be today? It was the heyday, everybody was making money, there was no crisis, there were just a few unhappy people. No one would have predicted this. So um, that's something really important to bear in mind. And we'll come back on this uh, a little later on. Um, conventional time series processes that we're, avail that we're aware of, the moving average process uh, and centered moving average. 
we have uh, the Shiskin seasonality forecasting method. So Julius Shiskin was someone who had, uh, headed the U.S. Census Bureau back in the 50s. And what they would do is they one of the methods that they proposed to uh, develop, uh, it was a sort of a modified seasonal index in where you would compile uh, the seasonal indices over many, many years, and that should smooth out. And you would use, so you would have a smoothed, seasonal trend that you would use to extrapolate. Linear regression and trend fitting. Uh, the census two method, so this is old school, this is back in the 60s and 70s, they had the X10 and X11 software which ran on mainframes and that is the trend decomposition which now we can do very easily using Excel. The foran process which is uh, what would we, it was a structured process of using, of mixing econometric data and trend fitting and all of these different things in a structured process. And they had some of it that had included uh, uh, picking out what were the best forecasts and so on to do that. That was very, that was kind of, um, well, that was kind of interesting to read about. Uh, other things, simple and double exponential smoothing, Box Jenkins Arima, and now we have the X12 software also available from the U.S. Census Bureau to do auto regressive integrated moving average. So uh, it is basically an application of the Box Jenkins methodology, and you also have Holtz and Winters uh, seasonal models. The typical forecasting and planning process that we have in an organization looks like this. We have a long-term strategic plan with key strategies, with targets. Then, based on that, we need to forecast uh, what our annual budget or plan will look like, and uh, we, we create seed values. Then we need to validate this. So if we have data and risk analysis, you know, um, data from the business, we can run using at risk our simulation, see how feasible this looks like. Uh, what are the risk percentiles associated? We can also use it to figure out uh, what we should be uh, allocating in terms of resource and capital requirements. This can be done very effectively using Risk Optimizer. Then we can look at evaluate, looking at updating the forecast. So then we have a rolling monthly forecast where we're taking in the current data that's coming in and we're using that to project outwards. And then that enables us to uh, loop back to our strategic plan and see how we're doing. So this is a typical business process around forecasting. So if you wanted to do this, some of the things that you would need are a forecasting model. You'd need current data, so a time dimension, a geographic dimension, um, by customer. Uh, I seem to have a few of these other ones. So by store, supplier, SKU, channel, the list goes on. So any way that you can get, so by any dimension, you can slice and dice the data that makes sense to you and you can get it in a clean, uh, coherent format, that works. Historical data, such as uh, COGS, variable expenses, fixed expenses, uh, maybe any assumptions that you might have uh, concerning the future of the business, you know, laws that might pass, things that might change the outlook of the industry. These things as well are, are very important to come up with a forecast. Again, as a requirement, you still need a model, but then you also need to have a forecast frequency and a horizon. So are we, are we talking about an annual forecast? Are we doing this on a quarterly or a monthly basis? What's the horizon? Are we projecting out three months, three years? Uh, what are the units? Are we calculating that how many widgets will sell? Uh, you know, uh, what's the uh, specific metric, sales, dollars? What are we working at? What is the detail? As we mentioned earlier, the more detail you have, the harder it is to get accuracy in there. So, how detailed must it should it be? And as you, since you're using historical data, you need to know what was going on when that data was being generated. So were there specific market circumstances that were happening? And as we mentioned earlier, you want to be able to segment the data. So therefore, to do that, you need to record that data separately. So you need to have certain granularity to your data. Other time series examples, because maybe you might not be in that whole sales thing and trying to you know, sell more cars or produce more TVs. But 
Uh, you could look at import volumes, uh, outbreak numbers. So if you were in animal husbandry or even like we're going to see the movie Contagion. So if there was like WHO consumption rates, um, share prices, exchange rates, bacterial growth, uh, GDP. So there's a mix of things that we can see both economic as well as scientific uh, um, variables that lend themselves well to being projected using a time series. What are the components of a time series? Well, you need to understand what are the relationship of the values at each model period, which implies correlation. Then the next thing you need are realistic ranges of a variable with time. So what does that mean? So well, we trends. So is, are the numbers progressing upwards over time? Are they going downwards? Uh, at what rate? So these are things that are important to know. Um, we look at seasonality. So do we have certain patterns within the data? Uh, if the classic example of seasonality, and we've all seen it at some point, hopefully in our stats classes when we were, when we were younger, was that you would look at electrical consumption or power consumption. So the power company would have, you know, now of course some of the books I was looking at were from the 50s. So you would have a lower consumption in the summer and you would have a higher consumption. It would peak in January and February and it would, and this would be consistent over time. And then when you introduced uh, air conditioning, well, that pattern changed. So then you had peaks both in February, January and February, and now in the summer months. So, uh, and those patterns, even though you might have a general trend, so it might be the po actual power consumption might be going up, you will always have those peaks and troughs more or less at the same, at the same time in a given period or in a given year. Cyclicity are things that, uh, you know, um, are price shocks, events, something that might not, is not seasonal. So you can't necessarily predict it on an even pattern, but you can identify them and you can account for them. So if uh, um, you have a, 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 uh, a political act of terror, that is a cyclical event that will have a high impact and that might change the, the outlook of your forecast. The And, of course, the relationship between uncertainty and time. So if you were looking at an options model, you, what you will find is that you will have a, a, a lot of uncertainty at the beginning of your forecast. And you will have, if you look at these arrows over here, you will have a reduction in uncertainty because you know what the value of the option will be at the end. Whereas if you were trying to for, forecast a, you know, uh, uh, the you know, the consumption rate of iPhones, what you might see is that you might have a horn, a trumpet, and that will, the uncertainty will increase over time. So we know that probably will do very well in the short term, but who knows with Android or uh, Windows, well, or even BlackBerry, what's going to happen, you know, maybe four years from now, because as we've seen, game changers do happen. Some things to know, if you, you should not project more than 30% outwards of the data you have. So if you have uh, 10 data points, then you should not go out more than three months. And of course, when you're looking at this, you should take your forecast and use what, you know, the smell test. So you look at it and you say, well, does this look like something that would make sense? And does this reflect what we think will be um, you know, uh, a relatively accurate portrayal of what the future might look like. So some of the ways of doing this are data-driven methods. So one of the methods, um, so GBM, so the geometric Brownian motion, which was, you know, incidentally, it was some guy called Brown came up with it. And what he had noticed is that, um, Bacteria was, you know, and bacterial growth was just moving at this really random pattern. And what they, what he saw is that it was a, what the, he would became then known as a random walk. And that's when you have no knowledge of what is going to come up, but you do know what the uncertainty is around a variable. So it's a, a stochastic process. And it really works well for things such as stock price, interest rates, exchange rates. Uh, could also work for bacterial growth, as uh, Brown had discovered in the early 20th century. 
it basically looks at uh, fractional changes in the variable between periods. So you know that month-to-month -month change that you might look like? Well, you would make that stochastic, so it becomes a normal distribution. And since they're uncorrelated, they're all independent, and the, what happens in period three has nothing to do with period one or period two. It is an independent, but it is a fractional change from what happened. So I'll, I have some example models that we'll look at in a few seconds. So autoregressive. So you would, it sounds kind of like a, an interesting word, you know. Um, autoregressive means it's a stochastic process for um, that you can look, uh, it's a stochastic process that applies white noise error. Okay, it looks at the, the, the weighted sum of the previous values and it gives you these very um, interesting uh, patterns. So if we were to uh, add white noise, uh, things that this is often used in the financial area. Uh, some of the models that, we, that we're familiar, we've talked about actually. So you have the actual autoregressive models. You have moving average models. Then you can combine them. So you can have autoregressive moving average, autoregressive integrated moving average. So that's what Box Jenkins came up. Then you have Arch, Garch, uh, EGARC, and APART. So those are heteroscedastic models. Uh, again, um, uh, just a fancy word to talk about stochastic. And again, these models apply to the returns. Uh, here are some formulas that you could look at. So you have GBM if you wanted to replicate these in uh, Excel. Um, so you have your mean and your standard deviation at a different period at said time of your variable at a said time. Uh, you have the Ingersoll, uh, the Cox Ingersoll model, the Gompertz curve. Uh, here's the revert, mean reverting stochastic here. So you can see that at, they use um, um, log, uh, natural log values and you can correlate them. So, and that you would do by uh, picking the mean of the previous. So, now I'm sure you all have been waiting for this, so let's take some time and actually get into uh, a correlated time series model. So there's a really interesting feature that we have access to in uh, in at risk, and it is the um, the correlated time series. So what I'm going to do is I'm just going to pull up um, the appropriate model, and I'm going to switch it over here. So just bear with me. And um, here we go, loading. Um, okay, checked everything out. All right, I'm going to switch this over, and here we go. So tell me if you see this, Jameson. Yes. All right, excellent. And I'm just going to go in the background, and I'm going to close uh, some of the other models that are running, and we'll bring those back up in a quick second. So you're getting a sneak preview of... Uh, of what we're going to be doing here. Okay, very good. So, hide these. This. So what we did is we went to the census, the Canadian Census Bureau, and we got some historical data on various commodity indexes. And we're just pulling up the entire data, and we're going to go over here. And what we had in this is that it's a from 1971 till. Uh, till uh, July 2011, we had the progress of an index the, of these commodities. So for energy, mining, forestry, agriculture, these actually happen to be true numbers. And for, for the sake of the exercise, we created a rolling volatility calculation, as you can see over here using these very nice spark lines, that for um, the volatility against these log returns on a 12-month rolling basis, 36, and 60 months over here. So that's the first thing to give you a sense of the data. So let's look at how the model is constructed. It's a very straightforward model. And what we did is we did a very simple exercise where we did a curve fitting. And we came up with a curve fit using um, I think I made it disappear. 
uh, but we used a polynomial which had a, an 80% correlation to it. And then we applied a normal stochastic process to it. So it's uh, using the volatility and the mean numbers to generate this. So we have the mean values over here and we have a 12 month volatility number over here. So it, how would this look? So if we hit, if we applied, made these numbers dynamic, what we could see is that by hitting F9, we can see that we have all these various market scenarios with the returns being forecasted per. per. And that has enabled us to create the following. So we have, what we did is we wanted to create uh, a model to figure out if we took $1,000, where would we invest that money to get the highest return over time? And that's going to be the topic of discussion. So if anybody wants to put up a... Now, Jameson, is it possible to get a show of hands here? Oh, we can have, uh, we can have our, our people just type in chat, and I can... I can uh, so there's no way to get a show of hands, right? Um, yeah, well, there kind of is. It's, it's, it's probably as good as the, the, the right board feature. Okay. So, <laughs> uh, it, it, because what I'd like to get is a sense of who thinks which commodity, I'd like to get a vote on, on which commodity people think will give them the highest return. Mm -hmm. Oh, I'll, uh, we'll, we'll take a poll, everybody. You can just type in, uh, what, what your answer is. I'll, I'll kind of tabulate and read them to Eric. And then we'll all, right. all know. Yeah, that sounds good. Okay. So while we're doing that, I'll just finish. So what what we did. So we took a thousand dollars, and then we th we did uh, we took that and we applied it against the various returns. So in this case, we're looking at the twelve months, and um, the, so we have the twelve months going. So we have one vote for energy. Okay, that's good. Anybody else? No. Oh, we've got energy, energy, agriculture, energy, agriculture, energy, agriculture, and we've also have mining. Okay, so one for mining. Energy. energy. So our majority is energy. We have uh, 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 quite a few mining and uh, two agricultures. Okay, so so. We'll 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 consider if uh, we'll I guess the sample size will tell us that more or less energy is the predominant one. So what we're going to do is we're going to run this model for five thousand trials for one simulation, and we are going to see which one is the winner. Now you might be in for a surprise, Jameson, because I corrected a few things in the model since we went. Oh, okay. Through. Yeah, we did this two days ago, and. It yeah, so I, I just wanted to make sure that what we were doing was sound. Okay. So one of the other things that we did while this is running is that there is a method, okay? So before we get into the answers here, there is at-risk offers a really interesting method for what they call a correlated time series. So one of the things that we did, and I guess I'll, I'll wait till this guy's done running and I'll just talk through it, is that uh, we did a correlation matrix, so we took the historical data and we went back five years, all the way to 2006, and we looked at the monthly data. And we asked, and we did a rank correlation, which we have in this worksheet, to figure out what was the relationship between those variables. So we took the relationship of the previous five years and decided that that would maybe be, at least for the sake of this discussion, an appropriate correlation matrix for the next five years. And what the correlated time series tool will do is that it will go through each line in your in your um in your data set so it'll go through line 1 line 2 line 3 and it will apply that correlation matrix to each line between the variables so now what you have is you've explicitly you know ex explicitly how you have correlated the time series however it is important to note that the underlying values that you would use to forecast. So uh, the volatility, the trend, the, all that needs to be done up front. However, once that work is done, you know, in a very artisanal way, you can come up and do this. Um, so 
to come back to our correlation matrix, we'll, we'll just hide this for a second. We took that, and this is the correlation matrix we generated. And when we came to the returns, we just said, okay, you're going to take these correlation ratios and you're going to apply them through each row. And it went pop. And then you would even see it pop, pop. And so that should give you a sense of how it's doing it. And if we ran this model uh, uncorrelated, we would have a um, probably less uh, volatility in there. Anyways, so let's look at our answers. So energy, so let's see. So let's start with the first one. So energy. And we go to the browse results. And what we can see is that we have a mean of 1100 or, you know, and 161 with a standard deviation of 50. Okay, not bad. And the minimum over here means that we might have lost a little money. However, it would have been a pretty safe bet that you would have, you, there was a 99.99% chance that you would probably not lose any money investing in energy. Okay? So that's interesting. Okay, now let's go look at mining. So now with mining, ah, look at this. We have a a mean of 1289 with a standard deviation of 40 which means that this would there we would have a much higher well it's a less risky investment and the minimum you know it, we are guaranteed minimum is uh, $150 more so 15% more than if you had invested in energy and it is less risky so going on here now, if you had invested in forestry, you might have lost, you, you might have had a slight probability of, of losing some money over here. So let's see how much that would be. So you'd have a 3% chance at a loss and a 97% chance at making more money. However, your mean returns are barely 4%, and, but it's not risky. And then lastly, we have agriculture, which, believe it or not, is almost comparable to mining, and therefore you have a uh, a mean of 1,239 and a standard deviation of 39. So the two best investments are mining and agriculture. And intuitively, just like most of you, when I built this model, I I felt that uh, energy was probably the one, but actually energy is the most volatile. But over time, and we and this speaks to um, how we understand and we envision the world. We in, we tend to forget that there is a food crisis. Now, I don't want to sound like the mother of motherhood, but we have a food crisis. And really, the tr the truth of it is is that over the last couple of years, food prices have been increasing around the world at a steady and incremental rate. And if and we and for those of us, for example, in North America, we don't notice these things up front. And then, you know, the idea of agriculture being, you know, a solid investment over the next couple of years, you know, had never dawned on me and maybe it hadn't dawned on some other people. I digress. Now, some of the other cool things that we can do. So uh, in terms of charting is that we can pull up what we call a, uh, a trend chart. So to do a trend chart, so we're going to browse the results and we're going to see, um, so over here, and see if we can pull it up. Ah, here it is. So summary trend. And to build the trend chart, it's actually really easy. You just highlight the range. And Shazamo. So in here, agriculture seems to be having, you know, a fairly steady, it seems to have a very steady trend. These are the mean values. And the way you would interpret this, okay, um, is that, uh, and I wonder why did that, um, why did that not come up a little more uh, hazy than that? Anyways, uh, I have other examples of, of time series that we could look at, but the value is going to be anywhere within here. Oh, I, I know why. Because when we did this, we projected using a linear trend. And using the linear trend, we feel that the value could be anywhere between these two green bars nine, nine times out of 10. And 
Uh, here is one, since it's a normal, it's plus or minus 66 percent, we think that the value will be in here. But we do feel that it is a linear trend, and that linear trend fitted at, uh, if you ever get an R squared value, uh, the easy way to calculate that is that if you take the calculator, and we had a point, I think it was like a 0.569 R squared, if you take the square root, that's a 75% correlation with that linear trend. So we'll just get rid of this. And that, and another way you could look at it is using a box with sewer plot. I have some interesting slides where we can look at other variations of this. So that is the correlated time series. Um, okay, so I see that we have a um, uh, a question from. Uh, I hope I won't um, mispronounce your name, but Yaya El Hassan. So uh, may you show us how you, di uh, how you forecasted the data in the first place? Yes, I'd be delighted to do that. It, it, this, of course, we didn't look at forecast doing something extremely sophisticated uh, for them, but let's see if I can uh, give you a very simple example. So over here, we have the forecast data. So we used the, um, we did a curve fitting exercise uh, I did delete some of these charts, but I will explain the process. And um, curve fitting is not necessarily the same as forecasting, but curve fitting is a very important tool for the forecaster. So what we have here, and I do want, I do want to caution people. When you do a curve fit, uh, it might look really good against historical data, but it is not necessarily, and I, I will mention this, it's not a good predictor necessarily to say that this is the pattern that will keep out over time. So what might have been true for the last 40 years might not hold true for the next, you know, five. Using, um, so when we did this, what we the, you take a time series and you can add a trend line. So I'm going to add a new trend line to make, and we'll take a linear one for the energy series. And uh, we will ask it to display the R and the equation. And the R squared value is what we did with, so if we were looking at a linear, what we would, what we would know is coming back to our calculation method over here, we would take 0 0.4989. And what R squared tells you is that it's counting for this line is accounting for about 50% of the movement. And if we wanted to get the correlation or what would be the equivalent of a Pearson's a Personian value of this, you take the square root and you would say that this line kind of correlates at 70%. Let's get rid of this. So this is what we did. So we actually used this for the other three. Um, we, we did this process. So I'm just going to delete this and I'm going to reapply it format trend line, and I will display the R squared. And what we could see is that using a um, a, a, a polynomial, uh, and I believe this one is a, is a, a fourth degree polynomial, we get an R squared of 0.76. So uh, this very, very much correlates or accounts for the behavior. So we did this for all the series and using these very interesting functions, we calculated what, using Excel, what these values would be, and we applied them here. There are other methods we could have used, but we just wanted to get a sense of what we were doing. And using these values, we then calculated out what the returns would be, and this is what is populating this over here. So these are the mean values for growth that we have projected, and then using the, volati the latest volatility numbers, we applied them uniformly across, and then we autocorrelated them by series. So um, we did not, uh, so did, we didn't use any, um, we could have done some smoothing or some deseasonalizing. Uh, we did play around with stats tools a bit. Uh, if we have time, I'd be delighted to show it. Um, however, um, you do need to have some sort of indicator of where your forecast is going when you do smoothing, right? Because, so anyways, um, 
please show us the detail. Uh, what detail are you referring to, Yaya? Because I have just a few more minutes, and after that I'll have to keep back to our presentation, uh, and we can always talk about these offline. However, I would like to try and answer this as best as possible. Yes, we used only historic, well, the historical data, yeah, yeah, is over here. So we use, if we come back to this data, this is, um, which comprise, the, yeah. So, uh, if you, if we didn't pull out the dates over here, but we have them in our other model, we do have the enumeration of the periods. So to get our general trend, we got it using a linear and what we're, because and using that, we're going to apply variability to that uh, base estimate. That's how we did it. And then we did it using uh, forecasted returns and assigning the volatility based on the last 12 months. And we carry that forward. We may have done, we could have done the same thing. Probably it would have been a little more appropriate to use the 60 month um, volatility numbers instead of the um, 12 months. So I hope that answers your question. Uh, yeah, yeah. Uh, we, the, what the, the point of the exercise is to, to demonstrate, uh, how do we use the correlated time series and, um, basically an explanation of how you would apply a for, uh, the returns approach to, uh, volatility on a curve. So, moving, uh, hopefully that will have answered the question. If anybody ha else has any questions, please feel free to send me a chat. Um, so, this is, and here just to my pleasure. And over here, just so we know, here are the dates. And by the way, a really nifty feature to clean up a model is to use uh, what I referred to um, as the grouping function. So, there you go. Okay, so moving along, going back to our PowerPoint. Some of the probabilistic graphs that we have, as we mentioned, uh, a trend chart could look very different than just a straight line. That's why in our previous example, we used whereas here we had not. Um, we used another method. And with that risk, you can look at it both using this and the box plot. So let's talk about time series fitting. So that's a good segue. So time series fitting, what it is? Well, it, it was pioneered by the Census Bureau. They had the X10 program in the 60s and the X11, and it would deseasonalize the numbers. It would do exponential smoothing, and it would apply various methods. And using uh, one various statistical calculations, it would tell you, well, this is the the just like we did with the the trend, the the curve fitting. It would tell you which model tends to approximate the historical data the best. Now, again, does that tell us which will it be good? Uh, will it be as good in the future as it was in the past? We don't know. So uh, it was used to test the forecasting models and uh, to try and figure out which was the better predictor. And of course, the other thing that was really useful, because you have to remember that in the 1960s and 70s, a lot of this stuff was coded in, and it was a lot of uh, uh, very labor intensive producing these kinds of analytics. Analytics in themselves are not new. Companies have been doing Monte Carlo simulation and forecasting and advanced time series for 50 years. What has become, what has changed over time is the cost and the energy so you even you could even apply a learning curve you know on what it costs to do analytics today so that's why it's it's become much more accessible to a lot of people and more people can do these things so that's why you guys um like i said you need to be um you, you really need to be able to look at the uh, uh to to use these tools to your advantage and um Excel and at risk really do contribute to this. Some of the tools that we could look at is that um, you, you, when you take your uh, your your forecast and uh, you you back test it, you could also use mean absolute percentage error. So you're basically looking at the accuracy of a fitted time series in terms of statistics with trending. 
and we've included uh, the formula. All these methods are, are well covered in um, in Wikipedia, or my favorite learning instructor, uh, Master Google. Another one is mean squared error. So it, what do these things do? You just need to slow down, and so they take the mean and the value that you project, and it looks at the error, and it does a square root of that. And as you know, when you're doing fitting using estimators, but you're trying to figure out the variance within that. Uh, it's also very good because um, it works at a level where randomness is used. Mean absolute de deviation, it's a simple, you actually have a an Excel function for it. And all it does is that it looks at uh, each data point and it looks at the difference that it has against the um, arithmetic mean. It's a very simple process. So we talked about backtesting. So why would you do this? Well, um, you pick a forecasting method. Uh, you slide back halfway to a midpoint in your data. And then you see if that process, if you used it using the previous data and you tried forecasting forward, would that make sense? Um, sometimes it doesn't. And a really interesting thing is, is that what they've seen is over time, uh, even though you might have these very uh, sophisticated methods, uh, exponential smoothing over time t tends to do better than a lot of other methods. So as we mentioned, if you're backtesting, it might work. It might not be a good predictor of the future because it was operating under the assumptions in the data that you had, you know, six years ago, uh, looking forward three years ahead. So things may have changed at that point. So how about integrating expert judgment? So we come off to our second of three models today. And we are going to look at the, so I'm just uh, taking a second to read uh, an interesting question. Okay, so, um, and we can always talk about this offline, uh, yeah, yeah, but I, I will try to. So, uh, you work at a power company, and um, you have 10 years of historical data, and you want to project 10 years out. Um, the... This is there, there, what's going to happen is that you're probably there's a lot of information that's going to come in using the trends in terms of consumption. Uh, there's going to be a lot of econometric data that's going to go in there. So, um, if for example, if you look at the adoption rates of electronics in the household, and that you see that you know 10 years ago people had one you know one two TVs a computer and and so on. And maybe based on the economic development happening in your region, that this is changing. So now they have routers, phones, this, that, and just the sheer number of things that are plugged in. Uh, I also am aware that in the Middle East, they're pilot testing uh, electrical car programs, which means that that might have an added uh, impact on the, sm on the grid, which is something that you guys need to plan and build out. So... Um, if these are if these are things that if this kind of makes sense to you, um, I'd be happy to discuss this, and then we can also look at how you would incorporate your historical data on the usage, and then use that trending and so on. So, um, so I hope that um, that helps. Um, fantastic, good. So uh, let's just uh, close this. Don't, well, of course, we'll save just because we and. Sorry, at risk. We don't need the data. And now we're going to go into here, and we are going to pull up our uh, power our power curve forecast. And I think you got a lot of people are going to appreciate this because sometimes we often have to get guidance in a business about what we think is going to happen. And uh, kind of like uh, the case that we were talking with Yaya, uh, maybe you go out to the business and you get guidance, or you have some of these things. Um, what we have here is uh, um, our forecast. So coming back to the same historical data we used, we have our mining, energy, forestry, and agriculture. So for you Excel fiends, okay, this is a uh, is no more than a um, a, uh, a validation. And here we use an index match. 
So it pulls out the mean and the volatility, calculates the P5 and the P95 for three points at 12 months, which you see here, 36 months over here, and um, 60 months over here. So it's three points, and um, it's three points, and that should enable us to create some curves. And in the, so let's put this on the expected values for a second, and that gives us this really smooth thing. So we know that we were able to calculate what these values would be. So P5, uh, sorry, P95, and when we turn the expected value, we know that this is right here basically a random walk. So but we see that there's an implied trend that over time the negative returns will go away and that maybe there won't be as significant an increase in the upper bound. So let's have some fun with this. So the first thing that I would like to show you guys is that you can use Solver or Risk Optimizer. In this case, I use Solver because it was um, it was already uh, kind of set up that way. So my apologies to the at-risk crowd. Um, but uh, where is it? There, there we go. You see, I don't use it that often, can't even find it. <laughs> so essentially, what we're looking at is that we have over here, these red boxes are to be optimized. And what it's going to do is that it's going to attempt to shape the curves in the most appropriate way possible. So to give you a sense of what that looks like, I'm going to just scan over here and we're going to hit data. Um, yeah, I got a question. So Solver is part of actually of Excel, okay? So uh, it's standard. You just need to install it as a, an add-in along with your um, data analysis tool pack. So this, of course, uh, and 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 um, the, however, there is a larger version of Solver out there, but this the one we're working with is uh, Excel. So coming back over here, so we picked a commodity, and we are just going to hit solve, and we're going to use a nonlinear solve. And what we can see is this is one scenario, this is another scenario. We here's another one. So you can see that uncertainty goes out and increases over time. And here's another scenario. And then we'll just keep that because we like the way that it fitted it. But say we wanted to we wanted to adjust this. So we're like, okay, this is cool. So we have our base curve set up. We set up these sliders. So if we first thing we did is that we can inverse the sign. So it will multiply it by minus one. And look what happens to the curves. So just by applying inversions, we can just start changing the pattern of what. So now we've noticed that the direction went from going up to now it's going down. Um, let's try this. So see, if we inverse the lower bound pattern, we can see that we're getting very different. And we have done, and here's another type of pattern where the risk would go uh, in, um, in reduction over time. So you, these are all different time series, and if I and if I ran this, if I hit F9, you can see what the index forecast would look like. You can see that it it gives it a very different pattern, so it's not too volatile here. And let's take some of these inversions out. Uh, whoops, that doesn't work. There we go. And if we hit F9 we can see that with the returns we're getting, you know, a various, so these are fairly stable numbers. We can change this and go into energy and have it refit again. So we'll go back, developer uh, data, solver, and we'll solve it again. And we'll see that it'll come up with di different patterns. Now I've left a few things that are inversed. So that's why things kind of, and look at this. We even have a fish. And we'll just stop that and we'll say, yeah, that's the one I want. Okay. And and so this is a very unique way and a very powerful way of getting your expert's opinion. And then they can just use their sliders over here. You know, they don't just have to use, you know, the, see, we can even have it change over there and reshape the curve, take it off the inverse add that 
And here we can even pull that, you see, like so. And this is an extremely powerful and uh, useful technique, and it enables you, and all of these, just so you guys know, it is all form in Excel. It's easy stuff to do. You just use the developer tab, and they are form controls. They will manipulate here. So you can, and you can configure these just so you can see how they do it. So we did that with the inverse, and we created all the math around this. And as you can see, with this type of forecast, you'll see that the pattern for the index forecast has changed significantly against what we were looking at previously, which was just hum humming around here. So we've created a far more volatile fo forecast uh, just by adjusting the sliders than we did initially. So does anybody have any questions? And by the way, coming back to this, this is a simple GBM because we've modeled independently each set of returns. So we're getting a question that uh, that people are using historical data and to make to project out forward. And now they've had okay, I see. So and now they've had the financial crisis. And what do they do after that? So, well. So coming coming back to the financial crisis, and we were talking, and I'm just going to, this is a good segue back to my PowerPoint. So if we were looking back over here, we talked about the components of a time series, right? And within that, you have cyclicity. And the other thing that you, you should be thinking about is the horizon. You remember, we, so if if in 2005 or 2007, the if you looked at how that period correlates with now so you would look you know three or four years and you would see how each data set correlates amongst each other you might notice that you might not correlate anymore with ha what happened in 2000 now a lot of the historical methods that that project short term like arima and some of these auto mean reverting auto regressive processes are very good to forecast maybe you know uh maybe 12 months out 24 months out, 36 at the may, at the utmost. But after that, those methods are useless. Okay, so um, that's why you to filter out for outliers, and that's why we talk about um, uh, recording the circumstances of the data. So you can uh, using uh, there are certain ways to account for that. Say, oh well, this happened, but it is a cyclical a cyclical event and not a seasonal or a trend, and a mean. A, uh, a mean reverting process means that even if you have a spike over time, you will whoops uh, hitting over time you will re, you'll turn back you'll come back to some sort of natural uh, average. That's why if you look at the stock market over the last 50 years, you've had like a four or five percent growth. You know, even though the market has gone up and down in very uh, uh, violent ways. And in fact, if you had invested, you know, $10,000 in 1966 in the Dow Jones, you wouldn't have seen a return of, of, of you would have made a very modest return by uh, 19, you know, 1989. You would have barely recovered your money. However, if you had invested from 1999 to, 19, to 2000, you would have made phenomenal returns. That's why we need to look at having uh, various forecast horizons, a short term a medium term and a long term forecast. Anyways, um if anybody wants to talk about this further, we can talk about it offline. So the next type of expert judgment that um that we can talk about are both decision trees and some sort of expert assessment. Now I just want to show you now these were come out of books that were written um almost thirty five years ago. And so decision trees are obviously not new. And what they enable you to do is to explicitly model a project. So we have phase one, phase two, phase three. What are the, does it work? It doesn't work. Gangbusters. And we try to figure out what are the potential outcomes that we, with an ex, what they would, a joint probability. So it multiplies itself until we come here with a probability of outcome. Oh, whoops. Over here, 
if we were to fl- if if you got if everybody were to flip their head over to the side, what you'll notice is in essence this is like a sensitivity chart. Here's what we think the numbers will be. Here's what the way we'd readjust them, and here are the factors affecting that. Very simple things. So they, these are not hard to to come up with, and they come from uh, experts. Another type of decision tree, and the, this this is I got this for a little while, a little while ago from Information Week, but this is what they call segmented decision trees. So. Um, Essentially, people are looking. Uh, this was a military example because it was I picked it up uh, like in 2004, 2005, and really what they're trying to do is they're trying to land a missile somewhere. Not a great example, but you know, uh, I would probably liken it to purchasing something. So you would have uh, two different systems. So you might have the local uh, system and the corporate system, and they and your customer that is in both of these. And what it is trying to do is figure out, you know, what are the decisions that you might make uh, from both from both vantage points. So if you were taking the idea of a missile, well, th- this rate, this sonar is telling you it should land there, and here are the various things that could happen. And the, the satellite is telling you something similar, uh, but might not exactly the same. And the aggregation. So if you get them both together, you can see the D4 and D4 are common. So when they when they put them together, D4 is so if you were working with a customer, it could be they want to buy aspirin. You know, they come in for for Pampers and they leave with aspirin. So um, uh, this is how. So you could have different decision trees and you can reaggregate them. Very useful if you have a lot of data and the appropriate data mining tools. Amongst others, uh, um, some of which are in the uh, DTS suite. Finally, we have uh, um, our last model over here, and this is a real options model, which is in essence a uh, decision tree. And if I have a few minutes, I'll see. I'll try and just uh, show an example of what a uh, what precision that there's a very wonderful tool within at risk called precision tree um, I do like it very very much and um, it is the best there at least as in this humble man's opinion um, there is no better decision tree tool out there for Excel okay now that I've thrown uh, the flowers and the checks going to be in the mail from Palisade let's move back to our example Okay, don't save, and let's open up our recent models, and we have over here our gold option. So over here, we have our very simple, um, we have a very simple model over here, and it's a lattice model. So as usual, let's start with the basics. So we went and we went to the World Gold Association, and this data is available online. And look at that. It starts in 1971 again. Everybody loves 1971. And this is the gold price, uh, the actual gold price over the last 40 years, uh, ending in, uh, okay, uh, let's see. ending in May of 2011. And we have used the returns over here. And what we have is, um, we, as we did previously, we fitted a curve looking at the, and we looked at the volatility. Okay, so what are the inputs? So for this particular example, uh we we just wanted to uh define a very simple model revolving around um what a decision tree uh is obviously there are a lot of things that might affect uh gold prices um probably you know i mean if you want to get fancy about it you can talk about econometrics uh governments are uh swimming in debt and the more debt they have the more gold is valuable so, I mean, we could probably uh, attribute that as a factor. There are other things, uh, currency, monetary policy, what's happening. So I did not look at these. 
I just basically took a what they call a univariate time series. So I'm looking at a very simple, um, I'm looking at one variable independently of all others, and I'm looking at how it would progress. And using a polynomial, we can see that we have a 80.8629, uh, you know, so over here what we did is we projected this orange line as a projection, so it is this forecast that we have over here. So obviously if we were looking at it over time, it would look very much like a, a line, okay? And it seemed, and it is a little above average than what it was, because if, if I came and I put the original values over here, you would notice it might act a little differently. So it might put it further up. I was not, so I, when it fitted it, I decided to readjust it to 0.695 and actually, and that'll do that, or we could even put it at 0.685 and you see you'll get a much closer trend. Now, the objective, of course, is just to get a sense of where we feel the the gold, the price of gold might be going over the next five years. So we use this over here in a very, again, a very simplistic model where we have the selling price of gold, where we have a benchmark where we where we think it's going. So this is our trend. So what we did is we used the the forecast over here. And then using the return, so the volatility that we calculated, so the the mean volatility, and sorry, uh, the mean returns and the 60-month volatility, we created the same distribution as a GBM. So if we hit a F9, we'll see that the market returns will change. And then over here, we just extrapolated a. We could have applied a much more sophisticated model, but we just wanted to get a sense our production costs. So you could have complete models built around each one of these columns. Uh, and in here, what we had, so we said, well, we have first mine that, that we, and we'll invest over here, okay, $50 million over 10 months, and that will bring on this capacity. And you'll see, and that capacity is 1.2, and it costs us, you know, our production costs by 1.2. And then at one point when we bring on the new stream online, well, we're making the assumption that our production costs will start going down at 2% per, per month. So here it was going up because as there's less gold in the ground, the more expensive it costs to get it out. I say one, it could be 2%, 5%. I, I'm not aware of the learning curve that we have here. There's a learning curve. And we said, well, it's going to change. It's going to go down again for a little while after we make a a further investment. Then we have our overhead, so which is a, a here we just said well typically over time we had uh, our you know our overheads 30 percent with a standard deviation of two, so that calculates the the actual dollar amount. Then our net profit is no more than taking our uh, our gross um, our gross margin less our net profit. So we get, sorry, less our overhead gives us our net profit. We have our production in ounces, and this tells us how much we made. So every month, how much this mining installation is generating. And what we're seeing here, and I didn't forecast it essentially, but I could have applied a, a uh, an, out, an at-risk output. We could see that here's what we feel our revenue. So it's probably somewhere in the vicinity of around $375 you know, million dollars. And we're generating that revenue with a um, $125 million investment over five years. So how does this look? So then we use this. So using these numbers, we went out, we looked, and we figured the risk-free rate given is probably somewhere around 1.5% uh, with a standard deviation of 0. Point, uh, sorry, 1.25% with a standard deviation of 0.25, and we put in our value. So we have the so we figure to us the value of this is worth 378 million. The estimated volatility around annual volatility is 17%. So this is a lattice model, and we've we've built it out in two ways. Uh, we use both a risk neutral method that uh, that has been extensively written on. 
And there's another method that was published by uh, Chen and A.A.L., which is uh, also a lattice model, but accounts for a failure in the second phase. So if phase two has, you know, if the price is not there or the costs are too high or, you know, we, we screwed up internally in the way we were going to do this project, it could die. So we created a failure percentage around there as well. And um, so the conventional NPV, so if we came back, because what we're going to be talking about is expanded NPV. And I'm going to explain that notion. So let's start about what is the difference between expanded NPV and regular NPV, and what's the relationship to time series? Well, the first of all, a lattice model is related to time series because time lattice models happen out over time. Again, to be consistent with what we've done, we've stayed within the 60-month framework, but we could have gone out to 120 months. We could have broken it down by individual months. So instead of it being from 0 to 12 to 24, it could have been 0, 1, 2, 3, 4. Uh, we can make go out to 10,000. Obviously, the more granular, the further out your lattice would go, the more um, the more precise what you're looking at is. Um, for this case, we kept it very simple, and we wanted it to fit on a page. So some of the things that go into a, a, a lattice model to calculate the upwards and downwards movements, you know, of, uh, of the asset, so up and down. And then you'll notice that you calculate these things going up this way, and it uses an up multiple, which is automatically calculated using this formula, which we have over here. And underneath, it's the very same, but it's using the down multiple. So it's like this goes here and here, this guy goes here and here, he goes here and here, and so on. And I wish I had a pen to show this off, but Mr. WebEx is being angry with us, so we can't do it. And of course, when you're, when you're, because uh, these models are recursive, they will, you need to come back. So you take the value that you came up at 60 months through what you be your possible values, and then you need to re you bring the, recurse them back until you have an option value. And then the other method, and then of course, what you'll see over here is that this pink zone over here is that there's a failure rate. So what you're doing is that you're calculating the option value even if the project failed. So you don't have to do that, but this is one way of doing it. And then you have uh, the risk neutral method that we, we sourced from uh, MUN. And uh, it's more or less the same thing, except you have an additional lattice to, to model out what the failure would be. So you have a phase one option and a phase two option. So if you wanted to take an option on the value of what that was, so what would it be worth to the company now doing that project or not, that is 91.06, so it's an NPV of 91.06, and if you and if they and on phase two doing the both phases, it would be 200. So why is this important? What's the difference? What's expanded NPV? You know, well, conventional NPV assumes that every decision will be made upfront. So when you build out your project model and you evaluate it and you cost it. Every decision is considered to be have made. We'll sell it here. We'll buy at this. The price is this. Everything is set, and that gives us a yield of about sixty million dollars. However, what really happens is that you have people that are working on these projects that can say, "Hey, wait a minute. The price of gold has gone down. We should not do this." Or our production costs have skyrocketed in this installation. It's not worth producing anymore from there. So they might decide to cut the bleeding and stop it at month 36. That's why you could have a 30% chance here of it failing. So, what, so then that typically results in a higher level of NPV because you are factoring in what they call management flexibility. The ability for management to make better decisions over time as they get better information. Um, so let's see how this looks and how and just compare these and then after that we can wrap up and do a Q&A. Okay. So we are going to uh, run this model again for 5,000 uh, simulations. 
So hopefully I, I haven't gone through this in such a way that it, I've made it confusing. Or Now, while we talk about this, one of the key methods, the differences between Chen and Mun, is that um, Chen's approach will take the the value of the asset and it will discount it five years from now. So we what we're looking at is if in five years from now, this will have generated us 385. Well, today, that 385 is worth 361. Whereas with the other risk-neutral approach, what you're doing is, is that you're discounting at each step of the lattice. So that's the main difference with the math. And um, so if we look at this, what we can see is that if we wanted to there is a there is a 95 there's a 100% chance that we'll do better than 55 million as an MPV with this investment. And we have a 90% chance, okay, if we pull this guy over here. So we have a 90 so 9 times out of 10, all right? And we can actually double click that. This is a very cool feature. Okay, so Sorry, uh, put that at 10. So nine times out of 10, our NPV will exceed 58.86, barring any. However, whoops, if we come back and we look at the expanded NPV with, with Chen, even though there is a failure percentage, okay, there is a 9% chance, okay, a 90% chance that we are going to be doing better than 105. Uh, sorry, uh, 100. Well, whatever, 106 million dollars. So right there, that investment may be, you know, using conventional NPV or the conventional hurdle rate, we might have passed over that project. Whereas, because if it goes bad, we can stop it, the stop the bleeding, and keep it profitable. You know, or keep the the bottom line of that initiative profitable, we have a higher possible NPV, and then, um, and that, and and of course, this is because we're associating a failure rate. I will show you what happens when we remove the failure rate. And over here, what we're seeing is that with a failure rate, with this, maybe with Mun, it's uh, it's a little less. So the expanded NPV doesn't seem so exciting here. However, I'm just going to delete that and put 0%, and I'm going to show you, because maybe you know, based on gold, there is no reason why there, there would be no commencement on that other project. So this type of approach is very good when you're looking at things where there's uncertainty or there are steps. So if you were in pharmaceuticals, you might have that same option, but with five steps mimicking the approval process of the FDA. Uh, if you were doing IT, you might have a governance process where a project could get killed at various stages of its uh, of its existence. So now that we've killed the the failure rate, let's look at what the. Now you'll notice that if you compared a traditional NPV of 60 with one with a mean of 237, maybe you might want to invest in these projects more. And you know, if we compared them, you know, based on these numbers, there's like there are two methodologies with different risk profiles. So as everything else you would do in risk analysis, you would um, you would have to pick the methodology that that makes more sense to you. And again, you'll see that you have a minimum of 245 with a mean of 261. Again, factoring in, so we're looking at almost a 200 million dollar difference against. So that might make a huge difference on whether or not to invest. So how do some of the other things to bear in mind before we wrap up? We can look at these as decisions to, um, we can build these out in different ways. Should we abandon an installation? So should, when do we cut off the bleeding? Use a lattice model for that. Uh, when do we expand? So should we add further like we did with the phases in this? But we can build that out as a decision tree model. And as you can see, it's lined out over time, and I do consider this to be a time series uh, method. So that concludes this model. Just very simply, um, I'm going to take uh, one last second and, and uh, show you the, um, the precision tree tool, and we'll open up to questions.
I'm not going to actually do any demos here, but I will show open up a few things. Uh, this is truly uh, a wonderful. So we're going to hear, and we have um, over here uh, Precision Tree, and we're going to. Okay, that was very that was very nice of you. Let's come up with the example spreadsheets, and uh, we can take an oil one here, very simply. And this, so this is a decision tree on whether to drill or not. And what you can see is that it is very easy to build this out. So if I if I double click on this, I can create decisions, logic, references, list out the branches, and add all the formulas that I want including at risk. So I can make this a probabilistic decision tree. And there is one thing we should, lest we not forget, you can get a decision, so what they call a policy suggestion. And it will go through and it will filter out and it will tell you what is the smartest decision that you should do or what would be the most optimal decision tree that you would try to achieve and here it is so it eliminates all the noise and it tells you which one of these decisions would be uh most of so obviously you would you should test and then here it's going so this is an extremely interesting tool so um that concludes uh my presentation if you have uh any uh questions um, please do not uh, hesitate to um, give me a call. What I'm going to do is uh, I'm going to uh, take a second and um, and uh, just amend something very quickly. So that concludes Thank you. that. Thank you. Do you want me to let's uh, do you want me to read off a few questions that that have come our yeah. way? Yeah. Yeah. By all means. I've got one. It's a while back. Let me let me go back. Just take me a second. I wonder what your comments are on this. Fourth law of forecasting not necessarily true. If the time series being forecast contains both short and long term trends and your methodology is biased towards the long term trends, then your short term forecasts may be awful, but your long term may contain relatively small absolute errors. What wondered what you thought of that observation. Well, I, it's because it goes back to you know the methods that you're for short-term forecasting is a a very difficult process, um, and and uh, long-term because when you're working with long-term forecasts, you tend to have um, my first. Let, let me break this down. The first thing I like to do is I like to separate them. Okay, so there a short-term forecast is for certain purposes within the business, and a long-term forecast is for others. And the types of decisions that I will use, that I will make based on each one of those forecasts are different. So um, you're absolutely correct that if you took a very long term and you projected a trend, you know, because you have 40 years of data and you wanted to project 15 and you, and it is a very, a fairly stable industry, you know, overall, you might get decent, decent numbers with a relatively, and it's, this harks back to the aggregation. And of course, with near periods of time, if you're working within a short term forecast, obviously, if I have data from the last three months or the last 12 months, it, those are probably much more indicative of what might be happening for the next three. So two different methodologies, two different sets of decisions. Hopefully that kind of answers the, the question. Uh, let's let's uh, let's see if we have. I'm glad we had some during the presentation. Let's see if we have a couple more. We do have uh, the number of questions. So please send us your PowerPoint slides. And uh, also, the the questions come up about can we have these models? I I do want to say that I don't think we'll. Eric's going to share these great models necessarily just by emailing them to our to our fans. But you I certainly welcome you to reach out to Eric and uh, have any questions that are really in-depth questions about his models. He'd really like to hear from you. And I'll, I can send out his, yeah, perfect. <laughs> and I will, will send out his contact info in my follow-up email. And also we'll have, a, we'll have a link to the recording of this webcast too.
yeah, we we didn't we less we would not want people not to know where to reach me, right? And uh, <laughs> I would add that it, you can reach me at these numbers, and my extension is 101, and uh, my email is etorkia. That's e t o r k i a at Technology Partners, written as as it is up here. dot com. So, Great. Now I'll put that. Uh, anybody who wants to reach out to me or or uh, book some time to discuss some of these things, I I tend to want to say that I we some of these things were put together more as an exa- to exemplify the methods than actually trying to you know forecast gold over. Uh, that's actually you know that's a <laughs> a lot of work goes into these types of forecasting projects. So what about any other questions that um just have one on the previous table showing investments of what is this five fifty million five million in the in the last column many rows have been left blank. What's the significance of blank rows in that table uh what do you mean um sorry, could you repeat that uh jameson? Oh, oh, they would like uh, to repeat the email actually. Here, I'm I'm here I'm I'm typing it into the chat Excellent, chat you. box. Now, if you uh uh right above in the here's here's this question. I'm going to send it to you. Here, I'll even put the the number there. I sent you that question. Okay, there you go. In the previous okay, got it. Oh, very nice. Yes, I can definitely do that. Um Now, you know, by the way, I just wanted to let you guys know, I since I'm closing up Precision Tree, uh I did a I did a uh a decision tree for one of my clients, you know, to explain them how it worked. And then the first question was is it is it raining or is it sunny outside? And then and then it said, well, if it's sunny, well, we can take the kids out to ice cream. They could watch a movie or, you know, what you you can sell them because they're getting on your nerves. And then you had the other one where it's raining. And then the first option was to sell them because they're getting on your nerves and the other things. And so the policy suggestion was that if it's nice, nasty out, you sell them. And if it's nice, you take them for ice cream. So um, I, I was very impressed with the absolute uh, genius of how precision tree works. Now coming back to uh, um, don't save. So coming back to this, I'd be delighted to explain. So this is very simple. Um, as you'll notice, there is a date over here. So the assumption we made here is that the, these first investments, if we were to total them, okay, for that year, it would equal the sum, and like so. And we are going to do format it like that. So we know that 50 million, and it was in, and it was invested at a rate of five million every month to build this project. Okay, and it was the, and over here the same exercise happened, and so this is the investment in the in the assets development over time. And the reason you would do this, okay, is that when you you are not constantly investing in new facilities and therefore when you're doing your npv it looks at the cash flows so since there are no cash flows here there's you know we're just running the you know running the the mine uh and we're not buying you know major capital investments you know digging putting in a hole these things get uh are that's why it's not there uh, i don't know if hopefully that would answer the question Well, I think maybe we'll have time for one more question, and certainly you can email us, email Eric if any occur to you later. I'll just I'll wait another minute and then. Okay, so hopefully. Uh, oh yeah. I'll tell you this was great. Thank you so much. Oh, my pleasure. I hope uh, I hope uh, everybody got what they were looking for. Nobody? Yeah. I I don't think so. I, we do have some people who will email you. They've confirmed that they'll. We'll get a hold of you. Hopefully, we'll. Yeah, and then what we need is so how many people are still online, anyways? Oh, we've got 33 still with us. Oh wow! So I'm yeah. very impressed. Yes. Yeah. And 
well, maybe we'll let you go for right now, and we'll we'll continue this later. And we'll, we're certainly going to have Eric back if he wants to. Oh, we'll be delighted to. We're 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 happy to work with uh, our friends at Palisade, and uh, we do offer a lot of uh, we do offer customized training on finance and risk analysis skills um, offered on site. And uh, I I need to do my um, my <laughs> need to mention this. And we do remote training, so oh, our training sessions are uh, six. It's the exact same program as you would get on site. But you get a a you work with one of our consultants. Often it's me, uh, two hours uh, in two hour chunks using GoToMeeting, uh, one or twice a week, and it's sixteen hours. And uh, there's nobody else, so we can work on your problems, and you know it's good for confidential stuff. Anyways, uh, if no one else has any questions, uh, maybe we can sign off and. Um, if you guys have, uh, and I'll look forward to emails uh, from all you from all you guys who um, who want to learn more. Yeah. Thank you, everybody. And thanks, Eric. Well, my pleasure. Thank you very much uh, for having me. We'll see you soon again. <laughs> all right. Bye. Bye, guys. Yeah. Bye. Thanks.